So for the next couple of lectures until the second midterm, uh, we're going to be talking about waves of one kind or another. Today we're going to focus on wind waves and then either at the end of the day or probably realistically most of the lecture on Monday will be devoted to breaking waves and that'll include some discussion of tsunami and I'll try to squeeze in some discussion of tides also which are actually in the context of this class going to be discussed as if they were waves because they are as it turns out a special kind of wave in the ocean. Uh, and that'll pretty much be it for the lectures before the second midterm. However, I should point out that uh, the midterm will, I think, cover one of the chapters of the book that talks about coastal processes. You can check the syllabus to make sure I'm remembering that right. Um, and I'm not really going to talk about coastal processes very much as a special unit and lecture. It just makes for a really boring lecture, I'm sure. It's a really interesting topic, and I'm sure somebody else could make it a really interesting lecture, but I've never succeeded in doing so. So rather than try and put everybody to sleep even more than I usually do, uh, I've put up a set of extra notes. So if you go onto the class website and you download the notes for this lecture, uh, there's actually like a whole bunch of extra notes tacked on at the end, and that's basically an old lecture on coasts. And I'm not going to specifically ask you questions about those notes, but since the book covers that stuff, the notes may give you some help in, you know, going over the book material, may give you a second perspective on it if the book doesn't quite make sense to you. So that stuff will be covered on exams, but I'm not really going to talk about it very much. So we're going to start talking about waves now. And I showed you this video from Oregon State's wave lab of a big wave being generated in a wave tank with a big piston in that case running down the wave tank and taking out a masonry wall. And you could clearly see in that case that the wave was moving across the wave tank. It was going from one side to the other, 100 meters or so. And so there was definitely something moving there, but the question is what really is being transported by the motion in a wave? And the interesting thing about waves, in contrast to currents, is that waves transport primarily energy there's certainly water moving in a wave, but the water itself doesn't move very far. The net transport's not very great. But the wave does transport energy from one part of the ocean to another, and it can do so very efficiently. So here's a little animation um, from Kettering University. There's actually a whole bunch of cool animations at the same website. And this is just an image showing kind of what a water wave might look like if we looked at individual particles of water as the wave passes by. And hopefully what you can see here is there's a wave moving from left to right. But if we follow individual particles, they actually are pretty much not moving in net as the wave goes by. Instead, they're just kind of making an oscillation back and forth and back and forth and up and down. Okay, so the wave is moving from left to right, but the individual molecules in the water are not in net being moved very much. They pretty much end up back where they started once the wave is gone. Okay, and you could actually see this. If you put dye in a ripple tank or something like that, the wave will pass right through the dye. Okay. And we're going to talk about many kinds of waves. We're going to talk about wind waves. We're going to talk about tsunamis. We're going to mention a special kind of wave that occurs particularly in lakes called a seish. And then we're going to talk about tides. And before we get into the details of different types of waves, there are some things you're going to need to know for this discussion to make sense. And that has to do with the anatomy and dynamics of the wave. There's some terminology that we're going to have to cover. And it may be review for some of you, but even if you remember this from high school physics or something like that, uh, some of the ways we use words are a little bit different here. Okay, so here's just a wave in space. So we could Imagine that this is the surface of the ocean as a wave is passing by, or we could imagine it's a light wave, or we could imagine it's a vibration and a string, or being fairly generic here. And the wave is an oscillation. It goes up and down and up and down, and it has a crest, a high point, and has a trough, a low point, okay, with depth in the water being down in this case. And if we look at the distance from, let's say, one trough to the next trough, corresponding to a length of one cycle of the wave, one full oscillation, that is the wavelength. 
And you could hopefully see that the distance from the crust to the next crust is also the same. You can define the wavelength either way, trough to trough or crust to crust. And finally, the amplitude or size of the wave, for the purposes of this class, we're going to define in terms of wave height, which is the vertical difference, the vertical distance between the trough and the crest of the wave. Okay, so how tall is the wave? Okay, so you're going to want to remember those four things. What is a crest? What is a trough? What is a wavelength? How do we define a wavelength? And what is wave height? Okay, hopefully depth you already kind of have some familiarity with, but of course you should remember what that is too. But that's not a new vocabulary word here. Okay, so this is the geometry, the anatomy of a wave in space. Okay, but of course waves move, and so we're also interested in the dynamical properties of the wave in addition to its shape at any instant in time. This is another animation showing just a synthetic wave, it's a computer model of a wave passing through some point, and we have a little red dot which is moving up and down as the wave passes by it. Okay? And so we can look a little bit at the dynamics of the wave by tracking how that little red dot moves as a function of time, okay, which is what's shown in this bottom left. And what you can see is that dot's oscillating up and down with time, and if we measure the time from let's say one trough to the next trough, this time axis is arbitrary. It's not actually in seconds, but if we pretended it was in seconds, hopefully you can see that the difference between one trough and the next trough is of something like six or seven seconds, something like that, six or seven units on the X scale. Okay. And so that would be the wave period. Okay. That's how long it takes, what the time is, between the passage of one trough and the passage of the next trough, or you could define it as the time between the passage of one crest and the passage of the next crest, okay? So it's a time measurement. We could alternatively think of that oscillation in terms of how often is the ball going up and down? How many times per second is it passing through the crest or the trough of the wave? And in that case, if the wave length is in this case some arbitrary distance and it's taking the particle seven, six or seven time units, six or seven seconds to go from trough to trough. That means the wave is passing at the rate of one wave cycle, one wavelength every six or seven seconds. So we can define a frequency of wave passage as one sixth or one seventh in this case. Okay. And finally, the wave speed, how fast is the crest moving? What's its rate of motion? How fast is the trough moving? Okay. So we have a wave period, which is a, in units of time, time difference between one crest and the next crest, or between one trough and the next trough. We have a frequency, which has units of reciprocal time, how many troughs are passing per second or per minute. And finally, we have a wave speed. How fast is the wave moving in meters per second? Okay. And these three things are actually very closely related to each other and to wavelength. Oops. Okay. So there are a couple of relationships you should remember having to do with the dynamics of a wave. And that is that the period, the time between passage of crests, is the reciprocal of the frequency. Okay? So if the period in this case is six or seven time units, the frequency is one sixth or one seventh. And the wave speed can be defined either in terms of the wavelength and period, it's the wavelength divided by the period, the distance between crests divided by how long it takes to go from one crest to the next, or even more simply as the wavelength times the frequency. Okay? How long is the wave? how many waves are passing per unit time. Okay, so speed is wavelength divided by period or wavelength times frequency. And since frequency is one over wavelength, sorry, frequency is one over period and period is one over frequency, those two things are equivalent to each other. Okay, so you should remember the definition of wave period, definition of wave frequency, definition of wave speed, 
and something about the relationships between those things and wavelength. All right? That's the vocabulary. We're going to come back to this a few times over the course of the next couple of lectures. Everybody got those straight? All right. So, when we're talking about waves moving across the surface of the ocean, as I already showed you in that initial animation, the idea is that the particles in the water itself, they're moving, but their motion is basically oscillatory. They're going around in something like a circle, not always exactly in a circle. We'll talk about cases where that's not true. Okay? But it's not the water that's being transported with a wave. There's not a current moving at the same speed as the crests and troughs of the waves. Okay. Something else is being transported. In this case, it's energy. Okay. And hopefully you've had some experience of this. If you ever go out to the Santa Monica Pier and you see the seagulls or the pelicans bobbing out on the waves, okay, the waves just pass right under the bird when it's sitting on the surface. And the bird will kind of move back and forth a little bit and up and down for sure, but it doesn't move at the same speed that the wave does. The wave is passing through the water. It's not moving the water with it. So the basic idea here is that waves, unlike currents, transport energy across the ocean. Okay, they're not transporting water all the way across the ocean. They're only moving the water in this oscillation pattern, which may have a magnitude of centimeters or meters tens of meters in extreme cases. But the wave energy can travel thousands of kilometers. It can travel across ocean basins. Okay. So as we go on, we're going to discuss waves. In particular, we're going to start <coughs> differentiating waves from each other depending on where the energy comes from. We're going to classify waves to some extent based on what the source of energy is, what's causing the disturbance that then travels through the water column, travels through the water surface. And of course, in the case of wind waves, which is what you would normally see if you went out to watch surfers or something like that at the pier, the driving energy is wind blowing across the ocean surface. That's mostly what we're going to talk about today. But that doesn't have to be the only way you can put energy into a wave. You can put energy into waves by having an earthquake or a landslide underwater that displaces water. And that would be an example of a tsunami, sometimes called a tidal wave, okay, where the disturbance that causes the wave energy to start is tectonic in origin. You can have energy put into waves by orbiting of the moon and the sun, or orbiting of the moon around the Earth and of the Earth around the sun and the Earth spinning on its axis. That turns out to actually put energy into waves in the ocean in the form of tides. Okay. And there are other ways, actually, but those are the ones we're going to focus on for this class. And then, by the end of the day, or at least at the beginning of lecture on Monday, we'll also think a little bit about where that energy ends up. Okay? You can put energy into a wave by blowing wind across the ocean surface. Once you make the wave, it can transport that energy fairly efficiently across large distances. Where does the energy end up? The ocean doesn't keep building up more and more energy, so that energy must be deposited somehow, and that turns out to happen when waves break, and we'll talk about what causes waves to break and lose their energy. Okay, so let's look in a little bit more detail particularly to anticipate our discussion of breaking waves and make a slightly more realistic picture of how these little particles of water move as wave passes by, as a wave passes through them. Okay. And let's take the simple case of a wave that's in fairly deep water, particularly waves that are in water that's at least half as deep as the wavelength is. And here are some little test dots that are moving around with the water. And you can see that they're more or less making a circular orbit. There's a little bit of transport. This is actually a slightly more sophisticated model of a wave than the cartoons I was showing you before. But certainly, the particles of water aren't moving nearly as fast as the wave is. Okay. And hopefully, what you can also see here is that the amount of motion of the particle in the water gets smaller the deeper you get. Right? The most motion is happening right up near the surface. And then as you get deeper and deeper, the amount of motion gets smaller and smaller until you're at a depth that's something like one half of the wavelength of the wave. Particles are barely moving at all. Okay? 
So the wave is passing by, but once you get below that depth, the water hardly notices. Contrast that with a case if a wave is traveling through water that is much shallower than the wavelength. Okay. In that case, instead of having this more or less circular motion get smaller and smaller as you go deeper and deeper, before you can get deep enough for that motion to go away, you hit the bottom. Okay? And of course, the seafloor can't move. It's not liquid water. And so instead of having that gradual decay of the amount of motion, what happens is the orbit that an individual particle in the water makes actually gets flatter and flatter as you get deeper and then right against the bottom because it can't go into the bottom itself the water motion that comes back and forth. It doesn't go to zero, at least not until you get right at the bottom itself. Instead, it becomes a back and forth motion with little vertical component to it. And another thing you might notice here is that we only have three particles. Here we have a much greater depth of water through which the energy of the wave is passing that's propagating the energy of that wave. So here the energy is a bit more diffuse, okay? The energy is passing through a great, and it's being propagated by a greater volume, a greater column of water. Here the energy of the wave is compressed. It's all going through a fairly narrow column of water, okay? So in this case, the motion of the wave is kind of more intense. It's more intensely felt by the individual particles that it's passing through. So we're going to make a fundamental di division here between what we'll call deep water waves, where the water depth is at least one half of the wavelength, and the particle motion as you go deeper it gradually declines to zero, smaller and smaller circles as you go deeper, and then at about one half the wavelength it basically disappears. And shallow water waves where the depth is much less than the wavelength, a number to remember is 1 20th. Obviously there's going to be some transition between 1 half and 1 20th. And in that case, the bottom has a big effect on the wave, okay? Particles very close to the bottom are now moving back and forth. They can't move in little circles because they can't move into the bottom and out of the bottom. They're constrained to move parallel to the surface of the bottom. And the wave energy is compressed into a relatively shallow section of the water. Yes? And the wavelength is the distance between the troughs. Yes, the wavelength is the distance between troughs. It's the same as the distance between crusts. So you could define it either way as long as you're consistent. So in both of these cases, there's basically one wave fitting in the width of the window. Any other questions? OK, so anybody want to take a guess as to what the period is of the wave on top when it's not stopped? Ballpark. A few seconds, yeah, four or five seconds, something like that. That's not bad. So what would the frequency be? Frequency is the reciprocal of the period. So it's going to be one-fourth or something like that. OK. So it turns out that the depth classification of the wave is not important just for understanding how the particles are moving, but it actually has an important effect on how fast the wave actually moves, what the wave speed is. And I'm giving you here some simplified equations, and the units, if you pay attention, don't actually work out. I know I told you in the first lecture for this class you should always pay attention to units okay, and make sure they work. In this case, I'm giving you some equations where the units are kind of implicit. So the units actually don't quite work. Um, but nonetheless, the equations do. And so in the case of a deep water wave, remember where the water depth is at least half the wavelength, it turns out that the speed of the wave, S, is primarily determined by the wavelength, L. And if we measure the wavelength in meters, then the wave speed in meters per second is about one and a quarter times the square root of the wavelength. This is kind of interesting, actually, because it means that not all waves in the ocean travel at the same speed. This is different from how we usually think of things like, let's say, light. Okay? 
light travels more or less at the speed of light, right, most of the time, unless it's in a traveling through some kind of medium. Sound, we usually also think of as traveling at a fairly consistent speed, the speed of sound, okay, which means that if I'm standing here and somebody shouts from the back of the room, all of the frequencies, all of the waves that are coming out of their mouth are traveling at the same speed and they get to me at about the same time. So I hear them all at the same time in the same order in which they were spoken. The waves in the ocean are different, okay? If there's a disturbance in the ocean that creates waves and those waves travel some distance through the ocean, the longer wavelength waves actually travel faster and arrive first. And the short wavelength waves actually take longer to get there. So if you generate a whole bunch of waves with different frequencies all at once, which actually turns out to be one of what would happen, for instance, if you threw a pebble into a pond, okay? Those waves aren't gonna travel at the same speed, and if you record those waves at some distance, you record long wavelength waves first, and then the shorter wavelength waves. And it can make a big difference. So if we look at a little ripple, again, something analogous to what might happen if you threw a pebble into a puddle, say it has a wavelength of about 10 centimeters, so about yay big, a few inches, and calculate out the wave speed, we get something like half a meter per second which is like a really slow walking speed. Ripples, you can see them move, but they don't exactly move very fast. If that wave has a speed of 0.4 meters per second and it has a wavelength of 0.1 meters, then it's gonna have a period of one fourth of a second and a frequency of about four, okay? Because four waves pass any given point within a second. But if we look at a typical wind wave, that might have a wavelength of order 100 meters, a pretty good sized wind wave. Okay, that's gonna be traveling at 12 and a half meters per second. It's gonna be traveling at like a slow driving speed or a good bicycle speed. Okay, it will go much, much faster than the ripple. Okay, so if you generate a ripple and a bigger wave at the same time, the wave will have traveled a long distance before the ripple even gets started. It's going to turn out to be important because waves are so efficient at tra transporting energy across large distances, particularly long wavelength waves. If you see a wave far away from where it started, very often you'll see waves that have sorted themselves out by frequency, by period, by wavelength, and we call that property dispersion. It's going to turn out to be important for distinguishing between parts of the ocean where waves are created and parts of the ocean where waves are passing through that were created somewhere else. Okay, so that's deep waves. Deep water waves, the speed is proportional to the square root of the wavelength. Shallow water waves are totally different. The speed of a shallow water wave goes as the square root not of the wavelength, but of the water depth. And g here is the acceleration of gravity, which is in meters per second squared units, about nine or 10. So we can pull that out. Square root of 10 is about 3.1. So the speed of a shallow water wave goes as something like three times the square root of the water depth in meters. So the speed isn't really dependent in this case on the wavelength. It rather depends on how deep the water is. The shallower the water gets, the slower the wave goes. And this is gonna turn out to be really important for understanding why waves break. Okay, when they get into shallow water, they slow down, the energy kind of piles up, and eventually the wave can't hold on to all that energy anymore and it loses it by breaking. Okay, so deep water waves, speed depends primarily on the wavelength. Shallow water waves, the speed depends primarily on the water depth. All right, questions about wave speeds? Yeah. All right, that's a good question. Okay, so for the 100 meters, and by the way, I, I'm assuming I did these numbers right, but it's always possible I made a mistake. Um, so if you had a 100 meter wave, and it was traveling at 12.5 meters per second, what's the definition of wave speed in terms of wavelength and frequency? Yeah, wavelength times frequency is wave speed. 
And so the wavelength is 100 meters. The speed is 12 and a half meters. So what's the? So it's just manipulating that equation. You're either multiplying or dividing those two numbers to figure out what the third one is. Okay, so in this case, the period would be about eight seconds because it takes eight seconds for 100 meters to go by at 12.5 meters per second. And so the frequency would be one eighth. And that's pretty typical for an ocean wave. Every few seconds or something like that, you'll get a swash up onto the beach. Any other questions? Yes, in the back. Yes. The shallow water wave, the speed of the wave is actually controlled by the depth of the water. That's right. So a deep water wave, the speed of the wave, and in fact, most of the properties of the wave don't really care what the bottom is like because it doesn't feel the bottom because the water isn't moving near the bottom. But a shallow water wave, by definition, feels the bottom. And so its speed, its propagation is dependent on how far it is to the bottom. Any other questions? All right. So we're going to look at waves, basically divvying up them up now, classifying them according to where the energy to generate the wave comes from. And we're going to make four divisions, but really only talk about three of them in any detail. The first is wind waves. These are the ones that are probably most familiar to you. Okay, wind blowing across the surface of the ocean puts energy into crenulations on the ocean surface. If it keeps blowing, those waves get bigger and bigger and bigger. And even when the wave, wind stops, those waves can carry that energy to shore. So if you go out to the coastline, you're mostly going to be seeing wind waves. In particularly lake-sized basins, you can actually get sloshing modes. And you can actually analogize, by analogy, like think of a bathtub that has water in it. Okay, you can make the water slosh from one side up to the other. Right? That's a wave, it's an oscillation, but the wavelength is actually bigger than the bathtub. Right? It's only one crest in the bathtub at a time. Right? It'll be high on one side and low on the other, high on one side, low on the other. So you're fitting like half a wave into the bathtub. Right? It's like a whole basin mode. And these kinds of whole basin modes occur in lakes. They actually occur in the ocean as well. And they're called seiches. And we're not going to talk about them in great detail, but they are kind of interesting. They can be driven by, well, essentially, in order to make a wave like that, you need a big, broad source of energy to sort of push down half the basin at once or shove the water to one side of the basin all at one time. And this happens in lakes, for instance, if you have a storm system, a low pressure system that goes over one end of a lake, okay, the air pressure all of a sudden drops, so the water kind of gets sucked up a little bit. And when the low pressure system goes away, it falls down and you can kind of set up a little oscillation okay, back and forth. There are tsunamis, which are set up by usually tectonic events, land moving, either an earthquake fault or a landslide or a volcanic eruption, something like that. And then we have tides, which are driven by energy sources that are kind of astronomical in origin. Orbit of the moon around the Earth, orbit of the Earth around the sun, the rotation of the Earth on its axis every day. Ooh. And just as an example, this is a, actually a tidal wave. Okay, It's not a tidal wave like you're probably familiar with that term. This is actually a wave driven by a tide, in this case running up an estuary off the coast of Great Britain. These tend to occur in this kind of dramatic fashion in places where the tide comes into a narrowing river channel or something like that. So the tidal energy actually gets concentrated into a very small place. Normally, tides are too, the tidal waves are too gentle to notice. Okay, this is all I'm going to say about seiches. This is just a picture from an old newspaper article from Lake Superior, big lake. Okay, and here you can see the water has gone way out. This whole pier is basically high and dry. And then the other, the crest of the wave comes into this part of the basin and buries the entire pier underwater. And you can get these kinds of oscillations in lakes and in the ocean to a certain extent. We're going to talk about tsunamis to some detail. In particular, looking at the Banda Aceh tsunami from, tsunami from five years ago. And there's also, unfortunately, a fairly damaging tsunami associated with a Samoan earthquake earlier this fall. So we'll talk a little bit about how those get generated. In particular, 
the Banda Aceh earthquake was a subduction zone thrust earthquake, and so popping up of the overriding plate actually drove energy into a tsunami in that case. But if we look at sort of what's the most important sort of energy source in waves in the ocean, we can construct, and I'm sort of wondering whether this figure is actually true or not, but nonetheless, it's in your textbook, I think, and you can find it online. If we just divvy up waves according to their period, going from short period waves, a tenth of a second, something like those ripples I showed you earlier, we calculated the speed of, all the way out to a day or more, which would correspond to tidal waves, most of the wave energy in the ocean is concentrated at wavelengths, wave periods of order 10 seconds or something like that. So typical surf, okay? Because the wind is blowing pretty much everywhere in the ocean all the time, generating waves that are periods of seconds or so. Tides are important, and there is a lot of tide energy. It turns out to be really important over long time scales. But their periodicity is only once or twice a day. And so they just don't come that often. Likewise, tsunamis can be terribly destructive, okay? but they're episodic. They only happen when there's a tectonic event of some kind to drive them. So we're going to talk about wind waves first. We can also think about, in terms of where the energy comes from and the characteristic period of the wave and its wavelength in particular, which kinds of waves are likely to be deep water waves and which types of waves are likely to be shallow water waves. And here we're thinking, you know, typical average depth of the ocean of a few kilometers. And it turns out by that classification, the only deep waves in the ocean are wind waves, okay, with wavelengths of 100 meters or something like that. Most of the ocean is much deeper than a few hundred meters, so those waves travel through the ocean not even really noticing the bottom is there until they get pretty close to a coastline and the water gets shallow. Seiches have wavelengths that are as large or larger than the basins in which they exist. So if you have a wave with a wavelength of a few hundred kilometers, that's much, much larger than the depth of the basin, okay, even if it's the ocean. So those are going to generally behave as shallow water waves. The bottom, the depth are very important for them. Likewise, tsunamis tend to have fairly long wavelengths. At least the most destructive, the largest ones may have wavelengths of order 100 kilometers or so. So they're going to be either shallow water waves or somewhere in between shallow and deep water waves, depending on how deep the ocean is and what the wavelength actually is. And then finally, tides are pretty much always going to behave as shallow water waves. We're going to talk about this next lecture Tides have wavelengths that are about the same as the circumference of the Earth, or half the circumference of the Earth, something like 40,000 kilometers or 20,000 kilometers. Okay? So they are much longer wavelength than the depth of the water anywhere. And so by that classification, they would always be shallow water waves. All right, questions so far? Yes? Uh, so you're talking about uh, condition black. Yeah. So the waves in condition black, the ones that the, the guys were surfing on on the north coast of Oahu, uh, those were wind waves. And those waves were generated by a storm off the coast of Japan. So it was very strong winds blowing for a long period of time over a long stretch of ocean. And so they actually generated very large wind waves because the wind was so strong and it was blowing for so long. But those were nonetheless perfectly run-of-the-mill wind waves in terms of where the energy came from. Any other questions? Okay. So let's look at wind waves in a little more detail. The basic idea here is when you have wind blowing across the surface of the ocean, you've seen this I'm presumably on a, sm on a small pond or something like that on a calm day, a little breeze will blow across the surface and generate little ripples that move in the direction of the wind. And then as the wind blows stronger and if it blows over a large distance, those ripples get bigger and bigger and bigger. Their wavelength tends to get longer. The wave height tends to get bigger, the longer and the stronger the wind blows. And so eventually you might get something that's surfable, okay, if the wind blows for long enough. So in this case, the wind is the source of the energy. 
And the longer the wind blows, the stronger the wind blows, the greater the distance the wind is blowing over, the greater the area of the ocean the wind is blowing over, the more energy is getting pumped into those waves and the bigger the waves get. And let's see. Hello, why are you saving? Okay, so here's a little flash applet to give you a sense of how this works. Okay, so imagine we have some elliptical area of the ocean surface and the wind is blowing across it, in this case from left to right. As the wind blows, okay, it starts up these ripples, and once you have a ripple, the wind kind of bites into it. Okay, it actually kind of bites into the backside and builds it up bigger and bigger, deposits more and more energy in that surface. So as it's getting blown along, as long as the wind keeps blowing on it, it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, until eventually, when it reaches the edge of where the wind is blowing, it's kind of reached its maximum size. And we'll keep going, transporting that energy even if the wind has stopped. And so we can actually, oceanographers have come up with various schemes to actually forecast wave energies, wave heights, wave lengths based on meteorological conditions. How strongly is the wind blowing, over what distance, and for how long is the wind blowing? Okay, so the speed, the size, the wavelength, the energy in wind waves basically depends on three factors. It depends on the fetch, in other words, what distance of the ocean is the wind blowing along so that it can build up these waves? The wind's only blowing across a short little place in the ocean, right? It'll make some ripples, and then by the time the ripples get to any size, they will have passed out of the region where the wind was blowing or the wind will have stopped, and they don't get any more energy anymore. The duration is also important for much the same reason. If the wind is blowing over a broad surface of the ocean, but only for a brief period of time, it won't be able to put very much energy into the waves. You might make a lot of waves if it's blowing over a large area of the ocean, but the individual waves won't be very energetic. Okay, so the longer the wind is blowing for in time and in distance, in fetch and duration, the larger the waves will tend to be. And then finally, the wind speed is important. The faster the wind is blowing across the surface, the faster it's going to put energy into those wind waves, and the bigger those waves are going to get all else being equal. And so this is just an example of a couple of the, of one of these properties. Here we're looking at an assumed wind speed of about 25 knots, which is not a metric unit. <laughs> but you can think of that as being roughly, let's see, 40 kilometers per second, something like that. That's a pretty stiff wind, actually. And we're looking at a fetch of 500 nautical miles, which is something like 1,000 kilometers. So this would be like a pretty big storm in the ocean. And as the wind continues to blow over that distance with that wind speed, the waves are going to get bigger and bigger. And then eventually, at some time period of about a day, something like that, they'll kind of level off and stop getting bigger. And what happens is, of course, if the wind is blowing at a constant speed over some large region of the ocean, the waves will get bigger and bigger and bigger, and then they'll start to make white caps, and the energy will kind of get dumped away to make sea foam and sea spray and stuff like that, and the wind won't really be capable of making the waves any bigger. Okay. So what you can see in a place where you're actually making waves by blowing wind across the surface, this is a picture from the North Pacific where the wind is blowing, is you're putting energy into making waves, but some of that energy is actually going away to make sea foam, to make little ripples that don't travel very far, and so on. And in fact, we can identify parts of the ocean where waves are being created, where wind energy is being dumped into wind waves because they look like this. Okay, so we can see, first of all, that the wind is blowing pretty strongly. It's making white caps. It's blowing over the tops of the waves. And one really important thing that you can see here, well, how would you characterize the wavelength of the waves in this picture? Is there one wavelength here? Here's like a big wave, right? Going up like this and then down, which takes up most of the size of a picture. But then if you look at that wave, 
Here's like a little hump on the side of the wave, and here are some little ripples. We have all different sizes of waves, all different wavelengths actually kind of jumbled together in one place. Okay? Wind is being, wind energy is being deposited in wave energy, and that wind energy is actually going into waves of many different wavelengths at the same time. So you're generating many different types of wavelength from the wind energy all at the same place, all at the same time. What's going to happen to these waves once the wind stops blowing? Not putting energy into them anymore. Which waves are going to move fastest? The little ones or the big ones? In terms of wavelength. The big ones are going to move faster. So let's say I'm a thousand miles downwind, okay? I'm not in the storm, it's a perfectly nice calm day, okay? Which of these waves are going to reach me first? The long wavelength ones, right? So I'll be sitting there and I'll notice some big, long wavelength surf coming in. And if I keep waiting, eventually that's going to get shorter and shorter, right? And it's going to take longer for the shorter wavelength waves to reach me. So if you're at a large distance away from the part of the ocean that's making waves from the wind sea, you tend to see swell. You tend to see waves where the wavelengths aren't all jumbled together, but instead there are a few dominant wavelengths. Okay? And that's because the waves are traveling at different speeds. Over that distance of ocean they've traveled to get to you, they've sorted themselves out. They've dispersed according to their wavelength. And so in this particular case, this is just a picture from a bay in New Zealand that looked kind of pretty because of the sunset. Hopefully you can see that there's kind of one dominant wavelength here, right? Here's one crest, another crest, 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 crest. Very regular progression as opposed to the chaos here. Okay, so this is evidence that we're quite a distance away from the region where these waves were actually created. They've transported energy away. And at this point, we're seeing that energy transported by waves of a fairly narrow set of wavelengths. And there are some little ripples on top of them, but there's clearly one dominant wavelength here. All right. So we can actually make a global picture of waves in terms of wave height. And which parts of the ocean would you expect to have really big waves? Well, we could probably rule out really small basins, right? Something like the Gulf of Mexico or the Mediterranean Sea. They certainly have winds. There are hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico for part of the year. But it can't blow over a very large distance of the ocean, so the waves tend not to be as big. So we're going to tend to find big waves in parts of the ocean that are open ocean and where the wind tends to blow strongly a lot over large distances. And that turns out to be the North Atlantic and North Pacific during winter when storms are most intense. And it turns out to be the Southern Ocean pretty much all the time. Southern Ocean is kind of the nastiest part of the world in terms of wave energy. Why? Why does the Southern Ocean have kind of bad big waves all the time? What's the zonal wind here? What cell are we in? Okay, we're at a lot of, right where my hand is, the latitude is maybe 50 degrees south, something like that. This doesn't go all the way down to the South Pole quite. Are we in the Hadley cell? No, that would be up here. We're not in the polar cell. That's actually right up against the coast of Antarctica. So this is in the westerly belt. We're in the Farrell cell or the mid-latitude cell. So what's the, what's the wind direction? It's westerly, so it's going from west to east. And this is, remember, the part of the ocean where the Australian, sorry, the Antarctic circumpolar current goes, because this wind belt can actually go all the way around the planet without hitting a continent. So you can think of the fetch, okay, the distance over, wind, over which the wind is blowing across the surface, as being very large. It turns out that waves can't go directly in a circle around the planet, but nonetheless, you can imagine that there's basically an infinite loop of westerly winds going around the South Pole. Okay, and those winds are strong, and so you have big surf all the time. So the sailors talk about the roaring 40s as being this region of the southern hemisphere where the wind is blowing strongly all the time. You get gigantic waves, but if you're in a race where you're trying to sail around the earth as quickly as possible, 
that's actually where you want to be because the wind is really strong and usually people go from west to east when they're sailing around the Europe world. So it's not a competition I would ever want to take part in because basically to do it as quickly as possible, you have to go to like the nastiest ride possible. Yeah. What do you mean by navigate? Yeah, like to get through because of like the speed and the wavelength. Uh, so the question is, are they harder to navigate than the Arctic? Uh, and the answer is no, but it has little to do with the wind speed. So I mean, if, if you went there, you'd want to be in a boat that was capable of withstanding large surf. When you get near the poles, the big problem is ice, by and large. I mean, the surf tends not to be as large. But yeah, an iceberg can do a lot more damage to a boat than a wave can, except under extreme circumstances. Or actually, they're both perfectly capable of destroying boats, but ice can do so very quickly and nastily. Any other questions? All right. So I'll just give you the first little snippet of a discussion of breaking waves before we go. Of course, you've all seen breaking waves if you go to the coastline. This is actually from Portugal, but you could go to Santa Monica and see the same thing. And the basic idea here is that when a wave gets into water that's shallow, okay, we've already talked about how when you transition to a shallow water wave, the wave gets slower, okay, its speed declines, but it's carrying energy. So you can imagine that energy is getting confined to a narrower and narrower area of the ocean. And furthermore, the water is getting shallower, so the energy is also getting confined to a narrower and narrower column of water. So it's like the energy is getting compressed in two directions. And eventually, it just gets too big. To be, with, to, held, to be held in by the wave, and the wave loses some of that energy, can't hold onto it anymore, and the wave breaks. And you can also here see some of the details about how this process works. Okay, in, in the actual moment of the water wave breaking, you can see that what's happening is the crest is kind of outracing the trough. The crest is kind of falling over into the trough in front of it, and that turns out to be how waves break, typically when they get into shallow water. And you can rationalize this by thinking about this shallow water wave speed, right? The water speed is dependent on the water depth. Near the trough of the wave, the water depth is at a minimum. So that energy has trouble going very fast. Where the wave crest is passing, the water depth is effectively a little bit bigger. And so the energy is moving a little bit faster. And so the crest tends to overtake the trough and fall over on top of it in detail. Now, that's not quite how wave breaking works, but hopefully that helps you remember, remember some of that detail. All right, so we'll come back on Monday. We'll talk in a little bit more detail about the geometry of breaking waves. We'll talk about tsunami and start talking about tides.